Hello, this is the RPG Crawler, and welcome to another Tabletops and Taverns. In this episode, we're going to take a look at an entire flavor of fantasy gaming, and some of the ways that it is implemented in role-playing game settings. I'll examine low fantasy this time, and cover high fantasy in a later video. I'll touch upon some of the pros and cons of each in their respective videos, but don't take this as a particular endorsement of either style. They both have their places. Furthermore, for most points in this discussion, we'll be addressing fantasy set in a medieval or equivalent world. Why? Because that's what I'm most familiar with. Modern fantasy and sci-fi fantasy settings are certainly present. Take a look at Shadowrun or Numenera, for instance. But as the most popular RPGs right now tend to be vaguely medieval-based, and that's what I have the most experience with, uh, we're going to go ahead and focus on that. First of all, low fantasy is sometimes confused with dark fantasy, which is a related and sometimes overlapping subgenre, and it doesn't help that low fantasy in literature has a distinct definition that can result in some media being cross-categorized, set as uh, low fantasy in literature but high fantasy in gaming circles, and vice versa. A lot of this stems mostly from semantics. In literature, low fantasy is basically introducing fantastic elements into an otherwise logical or rational world. Uh, gaming kind of focuses more on the scope of the fantastic elements themselves. For instance, something like Harry Potter or the Dresden Files would likely be considered low fantasy uh, in literature because they introduce magical elements into a world very much like our own, while in gaming terms both would be considered high fantasy because a lot of the main characters in action take place using those supernatural elements, so what's relevant to the characters tends to be high fantasy, even though it's an overall low fantasy world. Um, by contrast, literature would define something like Conan or the Lankmar series as high fantasy because they both take in they take place in fantastic worlds full of strange cults and rituals. Yet both of them focus on the personal struggles and the interactions of main characters whose views of magic are something that is dark or something that's to be avoided. And so in gaming, those would be considered low fantasy. Uh, the, the entire literary genre of sword and sorcery is probably a little closer to what gaming calls low fantasy overall. Since this is a gaming video for a gaming channel, I'm going to focus on the gaming definition. Generally speaking, for something to qualify as low fantasy in gaming circles, it's contrasted to high fantasy or epic fantasy. Uh, low fantasy tends to focus on more realistic tones. Sometimes called dark or gritty as opposed to the more mythic scenarios, low fantasy is generally very low-level friendly. Uh, especially in gaming systems that support both high and low fantasy within the same system. Dungeons & Dragons, for instance, is classically more low fantasy at lower levels, whereas at higher levels it begins to verge into like planar travel, wars with dragons and demons, you know, interviews with the gods, that sort of thing. That's all very high fantasy elements. This is reflected somewhat in the odd, comp the, uh, the especially old complaint, that a certain high-level mage has really took off and overshadowed their fighter uh, party members uh, as they gain levels. In the very early editions, level limits and the overall game focus tended to balance this out a little bit better than it does in later editions, resulting in this view that older editions of D&D &D were lower fantasy than the more modern editions. Uh, there's several elements and themes of low fantasy in gaming that can be identified, uh, not every game uh, that is identified as low fantasy needs to meet every single criteria I'm about to lay out. But the more aspects that are evidenced, you know, the easier it is to catalog that game as a low fantasy, or that setting as low fantasy. Uh, furthermore, it's easier to categorize a computer or a console RPG or a setting designed for a tabletop than it is for an entire system designed for a tabletop. As systems can be adapted for different settings, a particular system might, you know, a particular system has any kind of fantasy content in it, 
can realistically be altered towards high or low fantasy depending on the whims of the DM, regardless of its original intent. Now, this makes it less useful to categorize entire systems themselves for examination, but it can be useful to the dungeon master or the game master who seeks to craft a world of a particular tone without having to change systems. So you can actually use a system that's designed for high fantasy, nix some areas, and just make it low fantasy, if you like that system and you know it well. Uh, let's take a look at some of the elements of low fantasy in general. Some might argue that the primacy of a particular element in this list that I'm about to go over uh, counts for more than others, but I'm going to leave that off. This is simply going to be a list of examples in that are in my personal checklist, and I'm just going to list them up as they come to mind with no particular order. Uh, it should be noted that a lot of these elements tend to natural arise, naturally arise from just a couple of them. So as I cover each major point, I'll go over the minor facets that that major point kind of brings to the table with it uh, in turn. One of the most telling elements of low fantasy is the nature and role of magic and the fantastic within the setting itself. In terms of gaming, most fantasy settings uh, are medieval in nature, even discounting my earlier, uh, my earlier list of some. You'll find that most gaming settings that go for fantasy go for a medieval fantasy. I mean, there are some modern fantasy ones out there, but they're pretty much overwhelmed. Um, most of them take place on worlds that are not Earth. However, all of them have almost almost all of them have some degree of magic within them, even in a low fantasy world. In a low fantasy game world, magic is usually somewhat limited for various reasons. Either magic itself has its limits in its use, maybe it's rare and thus sparsely relied upon because you can't really count on a magic user being around. Maybe it has some sort of cost, such as a physical impairment, or deals with otherworldly creatures uh, that may not have your best interest in mind. In these low fantasy realms, magic exists. It might be considered unreliable or downright dangerous to deal with. The common folk may have never seen magic in their lives, and when they do, it's a thing to be feared or perhaps reviled. They may know of it through, you know, the grapevine, but a lot of them may go their entire life without seeing any magic whatsoever. Uh, or even if there are mag if there is magic available, like the local hedge witch that treats wounds and mixes poultices, it's still so rare and it still deals with such strange, from their point of view, otherworldly characteristics that they may still shun that person even though they're trying to help. Uh, in these sorts of settings, magic itself may arise from some dark realm, you know, corrupting any who use it regardless of what their intentions are. Practitioners may be oppressed or hunted by a church or government, and sometimes because, you know, sometimes rightly so. I mean, sometimes if magic in the setting is some gateway to strange creatures or allows destructive forces to roam the world, then why wouldn't you hunt down anyone who uses it? I mean, think about that. A lot of dark fantasy portrays these churches, these governments as corrupt, and they may very well be corrupt. But there's also an element of, hey, even if they're corrupt, there's probably a good reason why they're hunting down, they're hunting down magic. Uh, regardless of the reason, in a low fantasy setting, magic is probably rare enough, even if it's not actively hunted down. It's probably rare enough that even if it is relatively benign, the common folk just don't see it enough to become familiar with it. They never become accustomed to it. So they're easily frightened by it just from the unfamiliarity aspect. Low fantasy settings with low magic may exhibit a few other qualities as a direct result of all of this. And that contributes to the overall feel of a low fantasy, low magic world. First of all is uh, that with rare magic, Magical items themselves become rare. Suddenly, the collection of magic swords and other weapons you might find stockpiled in a high fantasy setting, they just aren't available. You don't see people walking around, you know, with full kits of gear. People may have to rely on more 
mundane items to fight both normal and unnatural creatures that they may come across. And those few items of enchantment that do surface are that much more valuable. Objects generally have a name and a history behind them rather than simply being, yay, another plus one longsword. Um, the rarity of magic makes magical items that in the rarity of magic makes the magical items that are there more valuable in another way simply beyond rarity. Because when you can't count on a wizard swooping in and doing various helpful things for you with magic, then items that take that wizard's place all of a sudden become even more valuable than even their rarity would count for. Uh, they give the players abilities that they normally would not have access to at all. Even something as simple as a faintly glowing magical crystal could provide smokeless light or illumination underwater, which are not things that a character in a low magic setting would ordinarily have access to. And that the characters in higher fantasy settings just take for granted. They, they figure they're always going to have somebody to cast a light spell. Well, that doesn't happen in a low fantasy setting. Something like a flying carpet... Or another item that is merely a utility item in a high fantasy setting can be a real game changer in a low fantasy setting. If you're the only person that has access to a flying freaking carpet, then all of a sudden you're the only one with aerial access, you're the only one with ease of travel. All of this shit kind of piles in together on this whole low, uh, low magic, rare magic type deal. Another consequence of low magic in a fantasy setting, in a low fantasy setting that relies on the low magic trope, is the lack of instant healing and magical recovery. When wounds can't be treated with magic, or at least not magic that works over a very, very brief period of time, then suddenly injury becomes far more serious. Fights become more deadly too, but the entire tone of the game may change. Because fights will be avoided when possible rather than everybody just rushing in, the players may focus more on ambushes and defensive tactics than simply running in with swords drawn. Uh, further, if there is healing magic but it's rare, it might be regarded as a miracle. You know, the search for a healing spring might be the focus of an entire adventure or maybe even an entire campaign. Say the king is ill, since there's no magical healing amongst the people. If you hear you hear of a magical spring, they may send the entire group out just to find out if that spring really exists. Finally, rare magic means that enemies that use magic are really, really scary. In a high fantasy setting, an army might have its own array of magic users for support in battle and sieges, but in a low fantasy setting with a low magic quality, even a single mage can spark fear into those who face them, even if they're paying a cost for it. I, I'm reminded of a sword and sorcery classic like the Conan series or the Fafir of the Grey Mouser series, again, I mention it, where the individual sorcerers were so feared that they could affect the fate of entire nations. Think Thulsa Doom. Think, uh, you know, Shielba of the Seven Eyes or whatever. In a game such as D&D, &D, the already lopsided power levels between a high-end wizard and the melee classes is made really visible if magic is somehow limited or dissuaded from use by the player characters, since then they have to rely on tactics and research to counteract what a group in a high fantasy setting might just throw another mage at. They, have, they may have to do their research, they'll have to learn what spells that the enemy they're going after is known for casting, and they have to work out ways to mitigate those spells without use of spells themselves, or rely on things like poison arrow or ambushes or things like that in order to take these enemy casters out. Related to, but not directly derived from, the rare or the rare slash changed role of magic in a low fantasy game, is our next issue, and that is the rarity and nature of monsters. In a high fantasy game, you might have entire armies of darkness assembled from these non-human creatures and monsters. It makes for mythic fights between obvious evil monstrosities and the supposedly relatively good humans, elves, and dwarves and such. But in a low fantasy game, especially a dark fantasy style variation, monsters are often more rare, but as a result, more frightening. This might be a result of rare magic, because there's less magic to sustain or serve as an origin point for these creatures, or it might simply be 
to keep the monsters terrifying, to keep them suitably unknown. The less often a character has a chance to encounter a creature, the stranger it may seem to them, and the more dangerous it is simply because the characters will not know how to deal with it. If magic is also rare, even a monster that is more common in another setting might pose a real challenge as the usual ways of foiling that, that creature's attacks or defeating it just aren't available. Making monsters and other unnatural creatures less common has a few other broad consequences, both to direct gameplay and to the theme of the game. The most obvious is that as an unnatural monsters become less common, there's a shift in the type of opponents that the characters will face. Without the more unusual and exotic creatures to face, you're left with humans, animals, the wilderness itself to take a more prominent role. This kind of in turn helps to humanize the conflicts presented. Because it's one thing to rush in and slaughter a horde of orcs, although orcs themselves can be used to great effect in low, man low fantasy games, but we'll leave that aside. Uh, but when faced with other humans engaging in like banditry or something, or simply as opposing soldiers on the battlefield, it might invoke a certain sympathy with some opponents. I mean, these are people. They're not just monsters. They're human beings a lot of times. And as most hum most players that I know are human beings, they may decide, oh, wait a minute, this guy may just be doing his job, you know, instead of being some ravening beast. The result is that there's a more gray area type th feel to conflicts in a low fantasy game. Absolutes are much harder to come across. Further, expanding the role of natural dangers, such as wild animals and weather, can sometimes paint a more realistic world in the player's imaginations. And that's simply because a, a realistic threat the player may actually have real-world experience with. You know, you have to imagine in your mind, and, and don't get me wrong, Imagination is the best canvas, but you have to imagine in your mind a 20-foot tall winged fire-breathing lizard, but if you invoke a charging lion or a wolf, it's often, you know, they may have actually seen a wolf or a lion in a zoo or in real life or something. So you get not just the visual representation in their mind, but the memories of that creature. The smells, the sounds, the, the, the look and the feel of that creature moving. Not all people will have this, but you're more likely to invoke if you, if you focus on a natural rainstorm, then people are likely to have encountered a natural rainstorm rather than a weird, magical, multicolored storm. You know, as I said, imagination may be the best medium, but if you combine imagination with existing experience, you can help paint a mental picture that can be used to further flesh out more, sometimes more fantastic scenes. Because then you can add that little dash of the unnatural on something that's otherwise very grounded. And then finally, a rarity of the unnatural creatures. It, it renders those that do appear so much more scary. And I've said this before. If you're going for a darker theme or want to mix more horror elements into your game, then establishing a world that has a set of rules not too distinct from our own and getting the characters used to that means that when they do encounter something that is out of the ordinary, it's that much more shocking because suddenly things are breaking those rules, rules which they know in real life. You know, to borrow a scene from a certain low fantasy anime that I'm not going to name, Imagine the surprise on a mercenary's face when they've spent several adventures engaging in battles with opponent armies and bandits and such, working up in a very gritty medieval-style world, and then suddenly when they're exploring some old old keep that they've been, they've been hired to look at, uh, it's not a bandit or warlord in there, but a demon, you know. All of a sudden, they encounter something they're completely unprepared to face, and they thought it was only the superstitious whispers of peasants. And all of a sudden, boom, it's right there in front of them. Uh, likewise, imagine a healer character who has spent all of her time tracking down like a wasting illness. And it's been just afflicting the area. And they've been trying, 
they've been ruling out that it's bad grain. They've been ruling out bad water. They haven't found any signs of infection or pestilence. And then they start finding signs that it might be an actual vampire. And they've grown so used to treating, you know, natural or near natural diseases that all of a sudden discovering evidence of an actual creature that they have never encountered that they only know from folk folklore can be a real shock. In a high fantasy game, the characters may not even blink. They just rush in heroically to engage these creatures, but in a low fantasy game, suddenly they have to prepare. They have to exploit those weaknesses that they might find mentioned only in old wives' tales or told to them by some doddering old priest. They actually have to learn more about the particular creature in question. You know, they study its history to find out its motivations, its habits, that sort of thing. It turns the engagement from a simple one-and-it's-done combat to a hunt that might span several sessions of gameplay because they don't have the resources to take this thing out. They have to exploit the weaknesses. You can even split the difference. You know, having some minor supernatural creatures be relatively less rare. Uh, not encountered every day, mind you, but the common folk might know enough to look out for them. Uh, and then the more exotic and dangerous monsters are really truly things of legend. Kind of put into mind the Witcher series, where some of the lower end creatures are common enough that the peasantry to they, they may encounter them in their day-to-day -day lives, know, know enough to stay away from them. Then you've got more dangerous creatures on top of that that sometimes have to be intentionally tracked down because they're so rare and so powerful, they go above and beyond, you know, the standard things that the peasantry may may run into, usually. And the final major quality of low fantasy game that I'm going to touch on is the scope of conflicts that arise. In a high fantasy or an epic fantasy game, things are often, though not always, played out on a grand or epic scale, thus the name. Great empires span these worlds, and in some of them, massive armies with thousands of soldiers clash head-on-head -head in these massive battles that are at least as magical as they are military. you got wizards throwing fireballs, you've got dragons flying through the sky. It's not unusual for the fate of the entire world to come into play in a high fantasy game. you got forces of absolute good and absolute evil throwing, each other, or throwing at each other. By contrast, a low fantasy game is often, not always, but often more limited in scope. Some of this is due to the lack of world-shattering magic. Some of this is due to the fact that these things just tend to take a more realistic tone. Instead of focusing on entire empires, they may focus on a kingdom. If they do focus on an empire, it may be one that's in the process of being fractured up. Uh, you may be facing different factions within it rather than, you know one empire versus another. It's not to say that there aren't wars to be had, or even, as I said, the sprawling empires. It's just that low magic tends to take its cues from the real-world history, or at least something that's quasi-historical. Because of the shift in focus and the influence of realism on the factions in a setting, it can be kind of difficult to make out who the good guy is and who the bad guy is. Uh, wars will generally be largely human versus human, and you've got all the nuanced web of all the nuances of the web of enmity and alliances that that brings about. Furthermore, the magic or the the battles themselves may either be reduced in scope, or the game may focus on subsections of it. In an epic fantasy game, people may be inclined to want to duplicate those epic clashes that you see in Lord of the Rings and so forth. Whereas in a low fantasy game, the increased physical danger from combat and the lack of logistics support from things like spells and flying creatures, uh, they result in more realistic clashes generally, especially in a realm modeled on the medieval style. Characters might rightfully be more focused on what they can what can immediately bring them harm. Uh, they may be focused on that charging knight rather than watching or participating in this mass melee with all of its inherent chaos. You know, that band of a few dozen guys charging down on you is a lot more threatening when you can't rely on some elvish healer or some dwarven cleric to patch you up. The reduced presence of magic in the supernatural little low fantasy setting also brings out a change in tactics. 
In a lot of fantasy games, D&D and the like, the default setting is considered to be vaguely medieval, yet the widespread presence of magic necessarily means that mass combat or even combat in general uses more modern tactics than you would expect from a medieval period. Fireballs provide the same sort of support that cannon and artillery might, while carpets of flying, flying creatures, or just flight spells can result in a sort of combined arms approach, where you have land and air, and in some cases sea, going on all at once. Sieges can be undone in an instant, by a well-placed spell or by an invisible infiltrator, and thus, ideally, many mass combats must use tactics far from the medieval norm in these cases. In a low fantasy setting, taxes, tactics tend to be more time period appropriate, be it medieval or otherwise. Sure, the threat of supernaturals going on is still there, but it's rare enough that your basic tactics don't need to really take it into account every single time. Not unless it's known that the opposing force is going to try something like that. Rather than having entire batteries of battle mages and dragon riders, an army in a low fantasy setting may have only one sorcerer, or a precious few monsters that they kind of keep on leashes and ration out, and by all rights, the opposition is probably keeping tabs on that sorcerer or those monsters like the super weapons that they are. Uh, you know, without the epic scale of high fantasy style clashes, Low fantasy does bring more of a focus onto the issues surrounding the heroes themselves, or the party members themselves, and you know, their immediate associates. In a battle, you know, as I already stated, uh, it's about what faces them at that very moment. We've got the unit level skirmishes. In politics and intrigue style games, it's a focused on the individual factions rather than vast alliances that span the world. You know, some of those factions may clearly be good or evil, but the majority of them are simply looking out for their own interests. In an exploration game, survival and immediate profit might take precedence over, you know, grand, grand uncovering of secrets. I mean, if you come across a forgotten city, it's there, and it's not going to go away, but you're less focused on getting or you're less focused on the city itself and more to surviving to get to it and then once you're there surviving the exploration itself rather than you know the grand over overall uh, scheme of things at the end though a low fantasy setting does not have to have all of these qualities in fact so long as it trends towards the more realistic side of things it could have few if any of these qualities these are just the elements that tend to be present now, some might assume that all low fantasy is gritty or grimdark, but that's not the case at all. Yes, these limitations on a fantastic setting do tend to drive the narrative in that direction, and a lot of really good low fantasy settings are gritty, and a couple of the really, really good ones are also really, really dark. But it's not always the sole conclusion to this kind of game. The same low fantasy tropes that can produce something like the Witcher series or a game based on the Conan world can also be used to a great extent to model something like the Knights of the Round Table. Bad end aside, imagine a circle of medieval knights with little to no knowledge of magic played in a system like Pendragon or something like that. Certainly it covers the low fantasy elements I listed above, limited magic, rare supernatural beings, more focus on the knights themselves, and their particular trials and interactions rather than, you know, the sweeping empires. And yet, a game like that could present a hopeful, upbeat tome despite everything, even with all the courtly intrigue and human frailties added in. So do keep that in mind. Even within its own genre, low fantasy can represent a lot of different tones. You have the dark despair of a Warhammer fantasy-style world, or the hope and pageantry of a knightly Camelot. You have the grim determination of witch and monster hunters, and all of those might be considered low fantasy. While they'd have drastically different presentations, chances are good that they'd share similar feel in actual play in terms of character focus and tactics. No, they're not going to be identical. But the same sort of elements are going to serve each flavor of low fantasy quite well, and one could readily look for inspiration in those other types of low fantasy that you're not playing.
Now, I'd like to go over some things that interest me about role-playing in a low fantasy setting. Keep in mind, this isn't me saying that low fantasy or high fantasy are intrinsically superior for every situation or every gaming or role-playing group. I fully intend to do a similar segment when I cover the high fantasy things. These are just things that catch my eye and then my interest when I'm running or playing in a low fantasy setting. Characters tend to be more cautious, and their players tend to be more thoughtful. Certainly, when mortality is around any corner, it can kind of inspire a sense of paranoia and make any decision take forever as the players kind of go back and forth about how even to open a closed door. And yes, you get groups that go full on, I don't give a shit anymore, and just treat life, you know, treat life cheaply. They just charge on through, and you get, you get Sir Bob the Ninth or whatever. But a lot of times, like it, it, the majority of times, especially if you play it a lot, and especially if the danger is not ever present, but it's still very real, you simply get players who are. Not the players themselves, you, you kind of shift the players into a mindset of actually paying more attention to their surroundings. They may ask you for to repeat the descriptions of where they're at so they can think them over again. They may put more thoughts into plans and thinking of ways to avoid conflict, whether it be actual conflict or, you know, just personal confrontations, than just rushing in. Even if it's the kind of low fantasy world that encourages them to be marauder types, you know, like some grand sword and sorcery world where they're playing barbarians or such, they'll still be more likely to consider things like retreat, accepting surrenders, or even surrendering themselves if things look bad. Why is this? Well, it's something analogous to low-level play in D&D versus high-level play. In low-level D&D, you can be taken out by wild animals, by lucky shots, and you may not be able to afford bringing somebody back from the dead. While in a high-level game, the characters can be counted on to fix, be, they can fix virtually anything that happens to them, given enough time. As a result, players of low-level characters either tend to be more cautious or get used to re-rolling the characters a lot. Similarly, in a low fantasy game, even if the character in question is relatively high level for that system, there's often little hope of bringing them back from the dead if something should befall them. And depending on the system itself, they may be subject to permanent injury or disease. So even a minor scuffle could suddenly pose a very real threat to even a pretty high level character. These all tend to factor into a more cautious approach. No one really wants to lose a character that they've been playing for a while due to some stupid decision they make. So maybe they'll try to intimidate that group of bandits rather than fight with them. Or maybe they'll try to retreat if they see some sort of supernatural horror springing unexpectedly from a dark. A lot of times in a low fantasy game, it's about what you avoid more than what you face. Aside from encouraging more thoughtful play and planning, I've found that low fantasy games also generally keep power creep and power inflation in check. Um, in a high fantasy game, a character may become little more than a kernel of abilities surrounded by more gear than a small kingdom should rightly be able to afford. And don't even get me started on settings that have full-on magic shops where you can just walk in and purchase a plus five armor set off the rack. With a limited amount of magic, if any, and a limited amount of spells to worry about, then the dungeon master can design encounters and challenges with less worry about them being just steamrolled through. You know, they can still be overcome by creative strategy and tactics, but you have to worry less about, say, a save versus someone's instant death spell going wrong, or the party just teleporting into a treasure vault, grabbing the horde, and then teleporting out again. Instead, the characters would have to plan their attacks carefully or do some groundwork to pull off that heist. Furthermore, when the characters do get that special item, they tend to value it more, as I stated above. And all this brings me to the last point I really like about low fantasy games. Players tend to, when placed in a situation where they can't rely on magic to solve everything, they tend to come up with more creative solutions to things. But don't get me wrong. Creative use of magic in a high fantasy game is just grand. 
but if you start limiting their options to more mundane items, all of a sudden you got a table full of MacGyvers if you're lucky. They're crafting crafting traps from stray rocks and, and, and twigs and ropes. Or they're coming up with new ways to use the terrain and take cover. And, uh, yeah, fire. Lots and lots of fire. You take away a party's magic, and suddenly anything that might burn or light becomes a substitute for them. And, you know, at least in my group that happens a lot. If For all the focus on things that aren't epic in a low fantasy game, few things are, are as epic as that climactic battle you know you know in the boss's fortress while it's on fire because somebody forgot that fire spreads or somebody lit a fire and forgot to you know, forgot to put it out you know they're sitting there battling and all of a sudden their past improvisations come back to haunt them and that's just really 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 fun uh, but yeah even if you're a fan of high fantasy games think about giving low fantasy settings a, a look from time to time you might be surprised with what comes up they're not all grim dark and brooding you know, not all of them are even deadly, even with a lack of magical healing. And the creativity that players exhibit when crafting strange and sometimes flamboyant characters in a high fantasy setting could be channeled into new ways to actually solve problems and conflicts, which in turn could carry back over into your high fantasy game as well. And as for high fantasy, I'll be covering that in the next episode. I hope that you found at least some useful information, maybe a little bit of inspiration in this video. For now, this has been the RPG Crawler with Tabletops and Taverns. If you like what you've seen, remember to hit that like button, comment if you've got feedback, share where you think that folk might be used, might be, you know, might like to hear a little bit about this, and subscribe for more RPG content. Until next time, take care and goodbye.